the video portion of this will run too. Okay. So the, you, Thanks Silka for letting me know. Yeah, yeah. Silka has a YouTube channel, and they'll put it up there as well. Perfect. And then, then there'll be an audio version, okay? Okay. <clears throat> All right, Marginal Gains listeners and viewers on YouTube, uh, again, welcome to our show. And we have a, a great guest today, an exciting guest. And I guess from a sport we really have not paid enough attention to, and that's the sport of triathlon. We know we have triathletes out there listening and viewing us um, interested in marginal gains. So it's terrific that we have we have Gwen Jorgensen on this show on the Marginal Gains podcast and here on our YouTube channel. And Gwen, I was you know I was thinking about you today, about you and your career trajectory, and I was thinking while I was thinking about you, I was also thinking about Michael Jordan. And here's why. You know, Michael Jordan did something similar to what you're doing. And Michael Jordan got to the peak of his career. He won like three NBA titles, three league MVPs. He was a nine-time All-Star. He'd really done a ton in the sport of basketball. And then he walked away. He said, that, that's it. I'm walking away from the sport. And, in fact, he went to a, a different sport kind of like you did. You went to running. Uh, he went to He went to baseball, right? He became a minor league baseball player. Um, and then shortly after that, he announced a, a comeback, a comeback to the sport, kind of like what you're doing. And Gwen is a, you know, a decorated athlete. She ran off 13 triathlons in a row, 13 wins in a row, won a gold medal, kind of did most of everything in the sport of triathlon and then went to a different sport, went to, went to running for a while. So why did you decide, I don't know why Michael decided to come back. I mean, We'll leave that up to the Googles and Wikipedia. <laughs> Why did you decide to come back to the sport of triathlon? Yeah, you know, when you talk about Michael and there's other athletes that have done that as well who have gone out and come back, I feel so cliche. When I left triathlon, I really thought I'd never come back. I left the sport for many reasons. I started triathlon because I got recruited into it, so it was never my choice. Um, it was my choice, but, you know, USA Triathlon came to me, said, we think you'd be good. They introduced me to the sport. They got me into it. And like within a year, I qualified for my first Olympics and um, it just kind of snowballed from there. And, you know, I went after a goal of trying to win a gold medal in Rio and I accomplished that. And in my head, I was just, I was over it. I wasn't enjoying the swim training. So I was miserable going to the pool every day. And I felt like I had done everything I could do in that sport. Um, and, and coming back, the reason I want to come back is I was pregnant with my uh, second son, who I had almost four months ago, and my husband was like, Gwen, I think, you know, you really want to do the mixed team relay. So the Olympics added a mixed team relay triathlon in 2020. They didn't have that in 2016 when I competed or in 2012. So um, I did feel like I missed out on that. And I said, sure. I'll come back to triathlon if I can only do the mixed team relay, which is not how it works. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what I was saying. And my husband's like, well, why don't we just, you know, start doing some biking and swimming? And I did. And I realized I'm actually having a ton of fun swimming and biking. And so it just kind of morphed into something. And I feel like this time around, you know, triathlon is my choice. It wasn't anyone else's choice. And it's really exciting. And the big motivator um, is definitely the relay. But as well, I'm just having fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael had kind of the same story, right? He kind of said, I, I think I've done enough in basketball. He had some family issues going on, too. And he thought, I'm now unlike Michael or Michael did not have a baby before he decided <laughs> to return to the sport. You did. That must be. I mean, and it's your second child to boot. Uh, it all sounds very complicated. But first, <laughs> the, the physical aspect, I mean, you know, having a baby, I'm told, is like doing a triathlon. I mean, it's just extreme physical event it takes a lot of pregnancy takes a lot out of your body so how did you get your body going again to get ready for what is you know the olympics and qualifying for the olympics and a, and a very difficult sport in triathlon yeah i always think pregnancy is um it's almost worse than an injury in a way not really but in the sense that it takes so long because while you're pregnant you can't really do anything and then you have your child and that's like a big trauma and you have to recover from that and you can't do any training. So, um, you know, it always like any return after an injury or anything like that, um, or time off, it, it feels like it's slow going. Um, but I look back, I'm like, wow, I'm only, I'm not even four months postpartum and I'm going to race in like a week and a half. So, um, you know, it's not an ideal timeline, but mm -hmm. it's something that I'm excited about. And I have a great team around me. I've had pelvic floor specialists and I feel like the people around me have just, really allowed me to recover. I also, um, my first child, there was, um, 
it was just like a traumatic birth experience. And this one, I had a really great midwife and team. And um, thankfully, it was uh, a much better experience. So I could bounce back a little bit quicker. Right. So we're all were you able to resume all the, all three sports soon after or was there a, a step up progress? Yeah. So, you know, they actually the protocol now is to wait 12 weeks to run postpartum, but mm-hmm. I got cleared to run at six weeks. I have a pelvic floor specialist and they um, and my OBGYN and midwife uh, cleared me as well. So um, I started biking at four weeks and then and walking Um but I didn't do anything basically those first four weeks and then just started gradually doing biking. And like my first bike was like literally 20 minutes under a hundred Watts, like just mm-hmm. super chill. Um, and then I could, got cleared to swim as well at six weeks. So, um, yeah, that's when I started training again. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want to sound like I know anything about, uh, pelvic floor PT. I've just heard of it. I, I'm kind of aware of it, but is that a relatively new type of rehab that women can do to help them resume sport or resume activity? Yeah, I'm actually really passionate about this and getting the word out because I think so many moms think that incontinence and pain and all these things postpartum are just normal and never going to go away. And that's not true. And with pelvic floor PT, you can solve it all. Um, so I wish there was more resources out there. Uh, you know, when you're having your child and you're, you're going in every month, every week for appointments to check on the baby, I wish there was those appointments as well postpartum because moms definitely need that. But um, it's definitely growing and something that if you've had a child, I definitely recommend doing. Mm-hmm. And that there's another thing you've had to battle through too, and that is this ankle injury. I know this kind of cropped up when you attempted your running career. When you took on the running career, you had a very nasty, what sounded like to me, a nasty sounding injury. I can't remember the name of it. How, so how is the ankle, how is that doing? Yeah, I had something called a Haglund's deformity. And so it's a bone overgrowth in the heel. And essentially what happens is um, your bone grows and your Achilles tendon rubs against it every time you lift your foot. And so every time I'm walking, running, doing anything, it was um, the bone was cutting the Achilles tendon. So yeah, I, you know, knock on some wood, I was pretty injury free in my triathlon career. And when I switched to running, I thought, oh, I've never had a bone injury. Like I'll be great. Won't have any injuries. And then there's these tendon injuries that can pop up. So, um, yeah, I had a surgery, um, on my Achilles tendon and, um, I've had actually both of them done and the recovery, it takes a while, but, um, they just go in and they shave the bone down so that it's not rubbing against the Achilles anymore. And, um, you know, I think the biggest, the hardest thing for me coming back from those was having faith in my Achilles. Uh, I'd go out and I'd be scared to run all out because I'm like, what if my Achilles hurts? What if it pops? What if it just yeah. breaks? Um, so a lot of it has been more mental than than actual physical physical recovery for it. Uh-huh. And where are you mentally with that? Are you totally confident? Um, I'd say I'm pretty confident um, in the ability of it, but I'm always, I'm hyper aware of it. Um, so anytime, you know, I do a hard session, I'm paying close attention, like, does it hurt? Where does it hurt? Is it the tendon? Is it because my calves are tight? Um, mm-hmm. And we've been working on some forum stuff as well to to not have that bone overgrowth happen again. Mm-hmm. So um, my research says that you were a swimmer first um, in high school and in college as well, and then kind of got recruited into track and field and running. And running, I guess, right now or was when you were in triathlon, your strong suit, you could really lay down the run. Um, but what, of course, we, what we want to jump to here on, on the Marginal Games podcast, a lot of what you focus on is the bike. So how did, how did the bike start for you? What was your introduction to the bike? And, and tell us where it fits into your, your triathlon being. Like, is it a strong point at this point or is it something you have to work on a lot? So tell us about how you got on a bike first and, and where it sits now with your, with your career. Yeah, when I got recruited into the sport of triathlon, I had never ridden in clipless pedals. So um, I started riding a bike just after I graduated from college. And I remember just falling over at stop signs and not knowing how to unclip and just, you know, basic things I couldn't do. Actually, um, you know, my first Olympics in 2012 was my only flat tire I ever got in a race. And I remember pulling up to the pit stop and you have to like change it yourself in triathlon. And so I went there and the people were kind of like, what wheel do you need? I was like, a rear wheel. And they're like, no, like, you know, what type of 
components you have? Like, what wheel do you need? And I'm just like, I don't know, just one for the back. Like, I was just totally, like, so new to triathlon um, and riding my bike. I'd only been riding my bike for, like, a year and a half um, at that point. So, yeah, um, biking, I'd say now, you know, it's how I met my husband. We met on a bike ride. Um, he was a professional cyclist, and he asked me out on a date when we met each other on that bike ride. And I'd say biking fits into my life just it's just like part of who I am. I much prefer to commute on a bike and, um, you know, I really enjoy the training on the bike and I'd say it is something that I'm constantly working on, especially skills wise. I have a fear, um, on the bike and that's something that will never go away and I'm learning to accept and, uh, go through and fight through. And I'd say power wise, I'm okay. I just, I'm continually and always working on, on the skill side of it. And I do that. Do you, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I do it because my husband, he recommends, you know, we do track riding, we do mountain biking, we do cycle cross races. So we do all these different types of bikes that have really, I think, allowed me to grow in, in road cycling. Uh huh. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, it seems that cycle cross would be a great, a natural thing for a triathlete to, to do, at least mix those in and winter train a little bit because of the mounting. Is that, is that why you do a little cycle cross? I would say the major reason is just to get comfortable on my bike. I remember the first cycle cross race, Patrick, my husband had me do, we were in Minnesota and we went to the course and to pre-ride it. And I was just like, basically in tears. And I'm like, I can't do this. Like I, I, there's too many tight corners. They're off camera. They're downhill. Like, how am I going to do this? And my husband just said, just run it. If you can't do it, Gwen, carry your bike the entire time and run the entire course. And I was like, all right, I can do that. And I remember the first lap I like ran 80%. And, you know, by the end of the race, I was riding 90%. So, um, it's just something I think, you know, like you said as well, the mounting, the dismounting, that's something we do in triathlon that has to be really quick in the, in the world triathlon Olympic, um, triathlon. So yeah, that definitely carries over as well. Hey, of course, what we're talking about here is transitions uh, for a triathlete, which I, where would you rate the transition as far as importance in a successful and a winning triathlon? It is so important. It can make or break a race. I actually think it made my Olympic race in 2016. Mm -hmm. I was on the cusp of not being in the front bike, bike pack. Um, I got out of the water and I was like kind of off the back, had a great transition and got in that front bike pack. And without that of happening, I, I don't know if I would have won um, Olympic gold. So it's something that can really make or break your race. Mm -hmm. uh, the Olympics, a, a great topic for you. Um, obviously very important for any athlete who has a sport that is an Olympic sport. And, and you're no exception to that. 2012, which uh, was your first Olympic Games. Do you feel like that flat tire cost you a medal? No, I think it gave me a medal, if anything, oh, really? um, in the sense that, you know, I, when I got the flat tire, I wasn't in medal contention. Um, you know, I think I ended up like 35th in that race and I probably, what ifs, right? I probably could have gotten top 10, maybe, um, I had gotten second at that same course at a test event the year prior with all the best in the world. Uh, but what really happened at that race was I finished and I just had this drive inside and I was like, I want to come back and I want to win gold. And it just really motivated me for the next four years to, to go after that gold. Hmm. And then tell me about 2016 was that's the gold medal year. You won, you won the event there. Was that redemption? Was that confirmation for you? How did you size that, that up in the end? Yeah, that, that was just a big, like, thank you, I guess. I, I don't know how else to describe it. It was, I have had so many people investing in me, you know, coach, psychologist, um, you know, bike person, swim person, run person, my husband, um, all these people just investing in me. And for me to be able to go out and perform on that day, if you've been to the Olympics, you know how hard it is to, to wait four years and perform on that day to show up. And I actually think that, I performed my best race ever on that day, which is very unique. And, um, yeah, it's just, uh, something I'm very grateful for. It wasn't redemption in any way. It was just, uh, something I had set, I had set a goal and I went after it and thankfully accomplished it. Mm -hmm. By the way, where does one keep a gold medal? 
<laughs> um, well, my husband's more protective of it than me. He keeps it in a safe. Um, he actually like went out and bought a safe one day without telling me and like had the code and like hit it somewhere. And I only found out cause I was like going through, the, not going through the garbage, but like saw the garbage. And I was like, why is there this box that says it was a safe? And so I asked my husband, he's like, oh yeah, I got a safe for your metal. It's like, well, are you going to tell me? Like, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. I got to take it out once in a while and wear yeah. it around town a little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually uh, took it out um, two days ago. I talked to my son's preschool, and I brought it, and I kind of explained, tried to explain what the Olympics were to three- and four-year-olds and five-year-olds. But, um, yeah, it was pretty cool to share it with them. That's awesome. They must have been, uh, they must have been very impressed and, <laughs> and to see a gold medal in real life. Um, so you are trying to get to the, 20, to the Paris Games in 2024. I think I had that year, right? Yes. And yep. coming, it's coming up really quick because we had the COVID year. So Tokyo got delayed by a year. Suddenly, I mean, the Olympic Games are coming up fast. Um, take us through, you know, how have you mapped it out? How, what's Gwen Jorgensen's plan to getting to Paris in 2024? Uh, my plan is to just perform, but um, it's, uh, you know, it's this big unknown. You know, I'm, I'm nervous. I haven't raced triathlon for six years, and I'm going to race in um, my first race, like, February 25th or something around there. And, um, yeah, I'm nervous. I, I don't know what to expect. I haven't done it. There's things I'm sure I'm going to forget um, about triathlon racing. You know, simple things like you use rubber bands to tie your shoes or you use Vaseline to help um, slide stuff off quickly in transition. So stuff like that I'm trying to, to remember. But ultimately, it is coming up very quick. I don't have any points. And to get on start list, you need points or you can be substituted in if you're performing. And there's a test event in Paris in August of this year, 2023, and that is a qualifying event. So my big goal is to, to get on that start line, which even getting on the start line will be incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. So there's Olympic uh, length triathlons. Is that the, the only type of races you focus on, or do you expand out? I mean, obviously, you probably get a lot of, uh, oh, do you do Ironman? Like, I'm sure people who don't aren't aware of what you do. Uh, professionally, I probably say, oh, you must have done an Ironman. And you say what to them? Like, what what are the distances you will take on? Yes. Well, even people who uh, do know triathlon are like, when are you going to do an Ironman? So right. um, it's very different, though. So the, the triathlons I do are draft legal on the bike, which is vastly different than long course triathlon. And the triathlons I do, the Olympic distance, it's a 1,500 uh, meter swim, 40K bike, 10K run. Uh, but I'm actually, the two races that I'm going to start with are sprints, so it's half that distance. Mm -hmm. And then the relay, which I'm really excited about, the mixed team relay, um, is a, like, 300-meter swim, 7K bike, and 2K run. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the draft, then. I mean, what are, what are some of the tactics um, that you might use that we might not be familiar with, say, in a group ride? Is there any difference there? Is it similar? You know, I'd say it's similar to like Tour de France or, you know, just road cycling races where, um, well, maybe, it, you know, I'm going to take that back. It's different because if you have a runner in your pack, people are going to try to get away from the people who can run. So I think a lot of times people um, try to break away from me because they uh, know that I'm known for my running. Sure. So there's those tactics of, you know, who's in your group or, you know, if I'm not in the front group and I'm around other people, they'll look to me and say, well, you're the runner. So you have to do the work to catch us up to the, to the front pack. So, um, yeah, there's those sorts of tactics that, that definitely play out in the race. And I would think I'm guessing here that the bike in particular is where most of the chess game is happening. The swim, you can have a hard time picking out people as much, but the bike is when you're really sizing up your competitors and where you're sitting at, at that particular moment. That's exactly right, Michael. It's, um, you know, in the swim, it's just swim as fast as you can, get out of the water, try to get in as, you know, front bike pack as you can. And then once the bike kind of settles in after that first lap. So the triathlons we do are all laps as well. So, um, you know, on a 40K bike course, maybe we'll do eight laps. Um, and I'd say the first lap is almost always really hard. And then people kind of start to look around, see who's in their group, see who's behind, see what the time gap is. You know, if you have a group of five off the front, um, they're going to really push hard. If there's a big group, um, you know, a lot of times they don't push hard because they, they don't want, somebody doesn't want to work harder and pull 39 people up. So, um, yeah, it gets pretty tactical on the bike for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so take us through your bike then. How for a 40k 
bike race, bike portion, what's your bike setup look like? Like, what are some of the things you'll consider changing? How do you set up your bike? Is it set up for aero? Give us a little thumbnail on on how your bike is set up. Yeah, it, um, it kind of depends on the race because there's some races that are hilly, some that are flat. But something that changed within World Triathlon just this year in 2023 is that no longer uh, jammer bars are no longer allowed. So we used to be able to have little tiny jammer bars or aero bars that couldn't go past the hoods mm-hmm. of your bar mm-hmm. or uh, couldn't go, the bars couldn't go past your hood. So um, that they eliminated that this year. So that I think will be seeing a lot different setups on the bike just because you can no longer get in that super super aero position. So maybe the bikes now will be more aero or have more, you know, aerodynamic handlebars um, to kind of make up for that, not being able to get in the jammer bars. But, um, you know, it's a lot similar, I'd say, setting up a bike for a crit race. Um, You want it to be fast. You want it because a lot, you know, a lot of times it's on a circuit as well. So um, be able to corner really well. So I think, you know, a lot of the things that are really important to me are the tires and the wheels, those choices. Um, They can really make me feel confident um, depending on, you know, is it rainy? Are we going over cobblestones? And so those things change race to race. Mm. Uh, Are the majority of the field running tubeless tires at this point or how's how's that setup working? Well, I don't know this answer because I, I mean, honestly, when I was out of triathlon, I did not pay attention at all for six years. I, uh-huh. maybe I should start paying attention again. Um, but you know, I really trust my team and, um, you know, what, what they decide. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, um, a new, some new wheels, I guess this year. Um, and we're putting like foam in them. Um, yeah. So we're going to see how that works out. Okay. Yep. Do you, Patrick must be a terrific asset when it comes to the bike. Patrick Lemieux, your husband, former professional rider. Um, he, he, does he handle most of your bike duties? Describe his role in getting you prepared for a triathlon. Yeah, he, back in the day, six plus years ago, um, when I was doing triathlon, he did everything. And he was probably the only person I really trusted with my bike. Um, we'd travel with two bikes to every race in case something happened, you know, one got lost or one got damaged or whatever happened. And, um, he would always set it up and check my tire pressure right before the race and, and do all that sort of thing. Um, but now with two kids, um, I'm trying to be a little more reliant on myself. So, you know, at nighttime, uh, when I'm feeding my four year old and it's like 7 PM and we're getting ready for bed, I'm like, Pat, start quizzing me. Like, you know, what's my gearing? What, what tires do I want to run? Like, you know, what's this, what's that? And I'm really getting him to, um, try to teach me more about my bike so I can feel confident in, in how it needs to be set up and, um, what I need to run. But, uh, we've been relying as well a little more on, um, I have a mechanic here in town, Michael Gavigan in, in Boulder, Colorado that I use, um, to help set up my bikes while I'm here. Mm -hmm. Uh, take us through some, some of the testing you might do for any of your sports. What, how will you decide Let's start with a swim. How will you decide what you're going to wear in the water, whether it works or not for you? What are some of the testing protocols you might do to to get in the right swim gear? Yeah, I think it's it's pretty similar on the swim, bike, and run. We can do all the testing, and I love testing, and we um, we do utilize testing. But at the end of the day, it's what I'm most comfortable in. So it's a lot of just you know, let's say for wetsuits. Wetsuits are very different. Some are um, stiffer have more buoyancy, but then you don't have as much range of motion in the shoulders. So it's kind of just a feel. And I, um, you know, go to the pool and just put one wetsuit on, try it, do another wetsuit and just see what's most comfortable. And I, I do the same thing on the bike as well. Um, I got a new bike. Um, I have a new sponsor actually on the bike, which I'm excited to announce soon, but, um, I rode the, the bike for the first time yesterday and I was just like, Oh, you know, the reach is just a little too off. And like it, the measurements were perfect, but I can just feel on the bike, um, what, what I want to change. And I think it really comes down to feel for me with that being said, um, you know, we're also talking about, um, doing like creating like a 3d replica of me. I don't know what they call it. It's called something. And then like mm-hmm. putting that in the wind tunnel to see like what positions are the fastest. Um, so we do all that and I listen to that and then I test out some of it. But again, at the end of the day, it just comes down to what's comfortable. I find that I push more Watts or swim faster if I'm just comfortable. Mm-hmm. And shoes as well and running gears, that's all the same thing too, that as far as testing protocols go? 
That's right. Yep. Um, you know, it's been kind of fun. I'm coming back into triathlon, um, and I don't like have a ton of sponsors. So it's been because I'm coming back and it's new. So it's been fun to just go out and like test and actually see like, what, what do I think is fastest? What do I like the best? Um, yeah, yesterday I did a, a workout. Um, I had three hundreds and I changed shoes twice and I just wore three pairs of shoes throughout the workout to see what felt best and, um, you know, in what form, where I could like get the most reach and grip and just what felt the best. Sure. Do you let, how do you let data inform your choices? Yeah, I definitely use data as well. So on the run, um, I use power speed and on the bike, you know, um, and you know, we have the Shimano pedals where you can tell like from right and left and like, um, as well, I have a, a bike fitter pork where we can see how I sit on the saddle and, um, in different positions and how much power I'm putting through and if I'm even and, um, how much oscillating I'm doing. So I do that stuff. Um, Normally, I'd only do it once a year, but because I'm coming back postpartum, I'm doing it a lot more. My body is just changing every single week. Um, and so in these early stages, we're doing a lot more testing just to um, go along with the changes that are going on in my body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's I mean, that's all, you know, a great way to kind of approach things. And we've talked about it here on Marginal Gains a lot is, you know, the data will help guide you. But ultimately, the athlete has to go. Okay, yeah, I can make that leap. Like the data and my brain saying, yeah, that's going to work on race day. You have to make that connection, right? That's 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 ultimately what you're looking for. Exactly. And I think, you know, there's the comfort which I was talking about, but then as you're talking about as well, there's that belief because there's always this learning curve. If you change your position on the bike or, you know, if I'm changing my technique in the water, um it's going to be slower at first because you're not going to have power in that position. You're going to have the power in the old position that you were used to. And so you have to have that faith and just be okay with being slower short term for those long term gains. Mm -hmm. um, Gwen, you're leading a, a hell of a life here. You've got two sons now, right? We have Stanley and George. Yep. Um, you're training, trying to qualify for the Olympics again. So take us through a quickly, through a day in the life of Gwen Jorgensen. How does, <laughs> what time are we getting up? How does the day progress? What time are we going to bed? What happens yeah. in between all of that? <laughs> um, well, I've been going to bed super early because um, my son, George, who's, yeah, the baby, he, he goes to bed around like 7.15. And so I'm asleep before eight, like 7.30, I'm asleep. And he, um, he doesn't really, my first son let us kind of watch TV um, after we put him down and George doesn't, which I'm kind of thankful for. I just like put him down. I go to bed. Um, and then depending on how many feedings I have to give George in the middle of the night depends on what time I get up. But my other son, Stanley, is almost always awake by seven. So I'm always awake by seven um, at the latest and um, get Stanley ready for preschool in the morning. Uh, he goes to preschool from nine to one thirty. And after I send him off at nine o'clock, I have a lovely au pair, Lulu. Um, I don't know how our first son, Stanley, we didn't have any help and I don't know how we did it. Um, this time around, it's been amazing to have Lulu. So, um, yeah, send Stanley to school and then I'll get my first training session done of the day. Um, and it, it varies widely, right? Like some days I'm doing a swim, a bike and a run all in one day. Today, for instance, I had some drills, some running drills for like an hour and I had a 45 minute run. And then later this afternoon, I have a hour and a half swim and a gym session. So, um, you know, it's a lot of just balancing. I've been scrunching my day, um, trying to get a lot done while my son's at preschool so I can spend some time with him once he's home. Um, but also making sure I'm getting in that recovery and, you know, it takes a lot of fuel and a lot of hydration to, um, I'm breastfeeding my George. So, um, just trying oh, yeah. to stay on top of that for, um, it's just a lot of calories that I'm burning. Yeah, uh, this this sounds like just a a monumental task and effort and goal. What is the rate with you? I mean, how have you? How does this settle with you? Are you? Do you feel like like it looks to the rest of us like, man, how is this person even going to pull I, this off? I mean, a lot of times I think I'm just insane, but I've set so many big goals for myself, and sometimes I've accomplished them. I set a goal of winning gold in Rio in the triathlon. I did that. I set a goal of winning gold medal in the marathon, and I didn't even get to the marathon Olympic trials. Um, so, you know, I, I set these big goals for myself, and sometimes I accomplish them, sometimes I don't. 
for me, um, it's what keeps me motivated. And I think the bottom line is I have faith in myself. I believe in myself. No one will know until the races begin. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm having fun. And in a lot of this, I'm, I think the big theme for me this year is finding play over perfection. Mm. It's, you know, I think when I was a triathlete eight years ago, it was a definitely a very different Gwen. Um, it was all like, you know, I could nap whenever I wanted. I didn't have two kids I needed to take care of. There was there was all these different things. But, um, you know, right now I'm calling this I'm Gwen 2.0. You know, I'm also much faster. I'm like a minute faster in the 10K and 5K than I was back then. And um, it's just, you know, I'm, I may not be taking naps, but I'm going to bed at 7.30 instead of 9.30. So, you know, it's just I'm a different athlete. And, um, yeah, I'm a little insane in a way, but it's what makes me happy and and what keeps me motivated. Yeah, I think the the question, I think for a lot of athletes is, can I make it fun and still kick everyone's butt? (laughs) And what do you think? Is that possible? Oh, that's definitely possible. You can have fun and um, do well, but I think at the end of the day, you can't control what other people do. Um, So I can only go out there and perform to the best of my ability, and I can't control what those other athletes are doing. And so... Um, you know, finding, you know, like I said, like finding that play over perfection this year is, is really important for me. Um, because when I make it fun, I find that I'm my best athlete. Yeah. Cause to circle back to Michael Jordan, I mean, he was the most intense guy ever. He, he not only pushed himself, he pushed everyone around him. That may have been the one thing he had a hard time doing was making it fun in the end. I, well, I don't know. I mean, I think in, sometimes like when I'm having fun, I become more intense. It's it's like like having this fun like okay. I, like brings me back to my childhood. Like think about when you do a race when you're a kid. Like you are going all in. You're super intense. At least that's how yeah. I was. Like I was just I've always been competitive and like I think finding that fun is kind of what makes it so tense and exciting sometimes. Right, right. Uh like you said, um you met your husband on a group ride in Milwaukee. Now, here here's a couple of bonus questions for you. Do you remember what bike you were riding? And for a bonus point, do you remember what Patrick was on? Oh, I definitely don't know what Patrick was on. But <laughs> this is like my Patrick and my older son, Stanley, they like recognize people by their bikes. They recognize who it is via their bike before their faces. And I'm just like not observant. Like I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you what Stanley's bikes are right now. My own son's. Um, he has like a BMX bike. I have no idea what brand it is. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure I was on an Orbea. Oh, nice. I, I don't know, though. Well, Patrick may have been on a team bike back then. Yeah, he was riding for, um, who was he riding? Kenda. Uh, okay. Kenda something, something, something. Five-hour five <laughs> energy. Five hour energy. Yeah, that's what it was. But I don't know what bike it was. Yeah. Hey, it's the man that matters, not the bike, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gwen Jorgensen, this has been a real pleasure. I mean, um, we learned a lot in a, in a little amount of time. We wish you all the luck here in doing this. Again, it seems from the outside like, wow, I don't know how anybody could pull this off, but I guess if somebody can, it would be it would be you. So we wish you a lot of luck. Thanks for being on the Marginal Gains podcast. Thank you for having me.